Hello and welcome to Biochemistry Focus webinar series. On behalf of the Biochemical Society and Portland Press, I am pleased to welcome you to this webinar. Uh, topics in the series include different research areas in the molecular biosciences, as well as practical sessions to support career development. Each webinar will give you the opportunity to ask questions via text and we welcome suggestions for future speakers. So welcome to today's webinar again. I am Professor Natalia Krasnogor and I hold a chair in Computing Science and Synthetic Biology at Newcastle University and also Royal Academy of Engineering Chair in Emerging Technologies. At Newcastle, I uh, engage in research that sits at the interface of computing science, engineering biology, and DNA, RNA nanotechnology. Today's webinar is called Digital Biology, Advanced Computational Approaches to Biological Design and Engineering. And we will hear from two researchers about their work, which has been enabled by cutting-edge computational methods. First, we will hear from Professor Christian Berges Schaffitzel. Christian is a professor of biochemistry at the University of Bristol. She has studied and worked at both ETH Zurich and the University of Zurich, and was a team leader and a European Research Council investigator at Ember before coming to Bristol in 2014. Work in Christian lab ranges from eukaryotic translation initiation via regulation of translocation termination to co-translation of membrane proteins via the bacteria holotranslocon. The lab's research is funded by BBSRC and the Medical Research Council, and the group was recently awarded the Wellcome Trust Investigator Award. Bristol is home to uh, Brisin Bio, a BBSRC, EPSRC jointly funded synthetic biology research center. An international team of scientists led by Christian and her Bio colleague Imre Berger have recently discovered a drugable pocket containing a linoleic acid in the electron cryomicroscopy structure of the SARS-CoV-2 spike glycoprotein. And this is what we will hear about today. Following Christian's uh, presentation, we will hear from Nicole Percy, a research fellow at the Synthetic Biology Research Center in Nottingham. SBLC Nottingham is also jointly the, funded by BBSRC and the EPSRC and concentrates on engineering bacteria to make industrially useful products from C1 feedstock, including the greenhouse carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and methane. The center researches both aerobic and anaerobic microbial systems, but its primary focus is aerobic gas fermentation, and the chosen chassis for this work is Cupria vidus necator. Nicole will today present on her work into the metabolic engineering of C1 gas assimilating microbes, which are being tailored as industrial chassis for the sustainable production of platform chemicals and biofuels, and on the genome scale metabolic models of aerobic and anaerobic industrially relevant chassis developed to practice metabolic engineering effectively. Before I hand over to our speakers, I would like to mention that uh, the Questions will be answered at the end of the webinar, but at all time you can send in your questions uh, by typing in the box that you have in, in front of you. The, uh, at this point, I would like to uh, hand over to uh, Christian. Thank you very much to the organizers and thank you for the introduction and for giving me the opportunity to present our work. And um, I'm going to talk about the fatty acid binding pocket in the structure of SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. So um, you probably all have seen this image a lot of times. It's the SARS-2 virus, and on top of the on the surface we have the spike protein, which is responsible for docking of the virus to the host cells, to the ACE2 receptor in the host cells, and then mediates the membrane fusion with the host cells. So it is important for infectivity. And this protein is the main um, protein, and all the vaccine development efforts are against the spike protein to develop neutralizing antibodies and to develop um, and thereby interfere with infection. So what we did at the beginning of the pandemic is that we decided to produce the spike protein and um, we have basically replaced the membrane part of the spike protein with a trimerization domain and produced the protein in insect cells. And that is worked by Frederic Garzoni and Julian Capin in our group. 
Now, for cryo EM, we have used the sample and flash froze it. And here you see a typical micrograph we get from cryo EM. And it's not your screen resolution. It is actually a really noisy image. And it's very hard to see the particles here. And that's a common feature in cryo electron microscopy. So how do we get from these very noisy images actually to a high resolution 3D reconstruction, which, um, which is quasi atomic resolution? The answer is averaging. So by averaging over many identical particles, we can increase the signal to noise ratio and actually come to a resolution of um, uh, 2.8 angstrom, which we achieved here. So we have used about 611,000 particles, compared each particle with each particle, classed them into different views and then averaged. And here are the 2D class averages. Now you clearly see the particle and all. there are high resolution features, alpha helices in the particles. And basically this process of comparing all the particles with each other is very computation intensive, but it can be paralyzed. And that makes co um, high performance computing and, and computing in the cloud possible. And this is what we have done. Now to kind of show you the, the process of um, cryo single particle cryo electron microscopy again, and that you better understand what we actually do um, by image processing. I'm going to show this movie. We have our sample in an aqueous buffer. We flash freeze the sample and then bring it to the temperature of liquid nitrogen. The sample is on a grid. We illuminate it in the cryo electron microscope. We collect these very noisy data and then we pick individual particles shown here. We have a starting 3D model which doesn't have to be correct, but which basically provides initial ideas how these different particles are related in view as used to each other. So by comparing the different um, images with the starting model, we can assign top, side and front views. And we have many more views because the particle is randomly oriented in the eyes. And by collecting many, many data, we can fill all the different views. And now all the images have attributed angles. So we know how they are related in space to each other. And this information can be used to reconstruct an own 3D structure from our actual data. And uh, by repeating this process and the resulting 3D structure is then again fed in as an initial model and do this many times, we actually can achieve a very high resolution reconstruction. So this is our CryEM structure of the spike protein. It's work done by Christine Tölzer, Kapil Gupta, Satish Yadav and Ufo Poruko in our groups. And we have in this cryo um, sample, we have identified two different conformations. Um, one of them is the open conformation. It's formed by uh, about 30% of the particles. And here in blue, you see the receptor binding domain of the spike protein pointing upwards. This is the atomic model where you see the, the receptor binding domain, which is up. And then we have the majority of the particles in a closed conformation where all the receptor binding domains are pointing downwards. So none of them is upwards. And if you look at this top view, you see that this particle is symmetric and we applied C3 symmetry and achieved a 2.85 angstrom resolution structure. Now, when we analyzed this closed conformation, we found extra non-protein density in the receptor binding domain. It's this tube-shaped density here. And this has not been reported in any previous SARS-2 structure, spike protein structure. At the point we had reconstructed this structure, there were two spike protein structures already published. And this density is present in all three subunits. This is the non symmetrized map. And you can see in the three RBDs in cyan, pink, and green, the extra density. And it's Christine's achievement to realize that this extra density is surrounded by hydrophobic amino acids. So it must be a very hydrophobic molecule. And with this tube-shaped density, she speculated that it is a fatty acid. And she compared this density and structure with um, all the available 
structures of proteins with fatty acids bound. And the most similar structures contained linoleic acid. And here's a fatty bind acid kinase, B3, and odorant binding protein, and both of them have linoleic acid bound, and it adopts a very similar kink shape. We provided additional in, uh, evidence that it's linoleic acid by using mass spectrometry. And this was done with uh, collaborators at the Max Planck Institute in Heidelberg, Joachim Spatz. Oskar Stauffer performed the AZ TOF mass spectrometry and he obtained spectra with a peak at 279 Daltons. This is um, electron spray ionization mass spec. So this is the iron and um, Therefore, there is a difference of one um, between the acid and the ion, which we detect here. So this fits extremely well, and we have a peak which is compatible with linoleic acid in mass spec. What is special about our structure is that our fatty acid binding pocket is bipartite. So here you see the Coulomb potential, and one RBD provides a hydrophobic pocket here in white, and the second RBD provides positively charged residues in blue here that interact with the carboxy head group of the fatty acid. What's special about linoleic acid? It's an essential free fatty acid. It's also a poly, so we need to actually take it up with food. It's a vitamin. It's as an unsaturated fatty acid and it's essential for maintaining membrane fluidity and surface tension in lungs. And alteration of the LA pathway lipid composition is observed in acute respiratory distress syndrome and severe pneumonia. And both of these are key elements in COVID-19 pathology. In the body, LA is metabolized to arachidonic acid and prostaglandins, and these are two key molecules central to inflammation and immune modulation. Again, key symptoms of COVID-19 pathology. Importantly, LA levels have been shown to be decreased in COVID-19 patient zero. So LA is depleted in uh, patients. We have then compared our spike protein structure with the two previous APO structures, which did not contain linoleic acid. In the overlay here, you see the APO structure in gray and our structure in cyan. And you can see that there is a gating helix moving away to make space for the linoleic acid. And in this gating helix, we have two tyrosines which need to swing away and then can interact with the linoleic acid in the pocket. The second RBD contributes the positive charge residue to interact with the carboxy head group. And to do so, it moves six angstroms closer to the first RBD. And as a consequence in the RBD trimer, the conformation is much more compact. And this is shown here. So the RBDs are much closer uh, to each other compared to the upper structure, which where the, the distance between the uh, two RBDs is 11 angstrom and more. So we have a compact structure here. Now, in the previous structure, about 75% of the particles were in the open conformation with the one RBD up conformation. And here I've colored in red the receptor binding motif. And this is the motif that interacts with ACE2. This is a crystal structure showing the receptor binding motif interacting with the ACE2 receptor. And Thus, this is the infectious form, which is compatible with ACE2 binding. In contrast, in our structure, 70% is in the closed conformation where the uh, receptor binding motifs are tucked away at the interface of the RBDs and the receptor cannot bind. And thus, this conformation is considered to be non-infectious. This is again an uh, image uh, top view. And you can see the receptor binding motif in between um, the RBDs. It's fully structured in our cryo-EM density, but it's not compatible with ACE2 binding. So at that point, we thought we need to characterize further the ACE2 binding of our LA-bound SARS-2 spike protein. In a first experiment, we performed size exclusion chromatography. We mixed spike and ACE2 receptor, and we obtained a peak 
which is looted at smaller volume, meaning a higher molecular weight. So there is complex formation, and we observe two proteins, the two proteins in the peak one fraction. Similarly, in ELISA, we see that the uh, spike protein can bind to immobilized ACE2 and compete with soluble RBD domain. So it binds ACE2. Now, this is the important experiment where we then decided to co compare LA bound spike with APO spike. This has been done by Bayer core experiment with immobilized ACE2, and we removed from the LA bound spike the LA with a lipidex column to obtain APO spike. And when we removed the linoleic acid, we constantly observed, um, consistently observed a higher signal. So more APO spike binds to the surface at same concentration compared to LA bound spike. And consequently, the dissociation constant is smaller, meaning higher affinity for the APO spike compared to the LA bound spike. This has consequences for infectivity, we thought, and we convinced our colleague Andrew Davidson to perform experiments with live SARS virus. And here, you see um, immunofluorescence images. The virus is green and the cells are blue. In the upper row, this is the inhibition of virus replication by remdesivir. So with increasing remdesivir um, concentrations, the virus replication is blocked. And a much stronger effect on virus replication is seen when we mix LA and remdesivir. So the two synergize to block virus replication. And this can also be followed by quantitative RT-PCR, where we see less viral RNA present in the sample when we add remdesivir and linoleic acid. So LA and remdesivir synergize to suppress SARS-2 virus replication. The spike protein structure and sequence is conserved among the coronaviruses. And here, this is a sequence comparison between the seven coronaviruses that can infect humans. The residues that line the hydrophobic pocket are underlaid in cyan, including the, in purple, the two tyrosines that swing away in the gating helix. And we have in green the residues that um, interact with the carboxyl head group. If you compare SARS-2 and SARS-1, you see that all these residues in the hydrophobic pocket are conserved and also the positive residues. So we predict that SARS-1 would also have a linoleic acid binding pocket in the receptor binding domain. In MERS, the sequence is less well conserved, but the residues lining the pocket are still hydrophobic. So there is a hydrophobic pocket and there are also positively charged residues in the neighboring adjacent RBD, which could interact with the carboxyl head group. So possibly MERS2 also has a fatty acid binding pocket. Now, how can we carry this forward? I've shown you that in the APO structure, 75% is in the open conformation, whereas in the LA bound structure, the majority is in the closed conformation. So if we now could develop a molecule that binds even better than LA, we would have a, a potential, very potential um, and good antiviral, which potentially could lock it entirely in the non-infectious form. And, there, and hopefully irreversibly lock it there and thereby decrease SARS-2 infectivity. There is a very encouraging precedent for such an approach from Michael Rossman's group. And um, this is used to uh, treat rhinovirus infections. Rhinoviruses have a receptor binding protein with a fatty acid binding pocket. And um, the, the group has developed wind compounds which bind into this hydrophobic pocket and block receptor binding proteins directly and thereby they completely abolish infectivity of rhinoviruses and this is successfully used in the clinic already. Now in summary I've shown you that we have discovered an LA binding pocket in the SARS-CoV-2 spike this provides the first direct structural link between linoleic acid, COVID-19 pathology, and the SARS-2 virus itself. The pocket is bipartite. It connects two RBDs within the trimer. It stabilizes the locked form of the spike protein. 
and this locked form is non-infectious. The fatty acid binding pocket appears to be present in other disease causing coronaviruses as well. And we think that the pocket is, is drivable and we could develop antivirals um, which would then lock the, the spike protein entirely in the non-infectious form. Moreover, other, uh, other proteins along the multinodal LA signaling axis could be targeted to um, achieve a therapeutic intervention against SARS-2 infections. Thank you very much for your attention and with this I would like to thank those who contributed to the work. This was a collaboration with Emre Berger and um, Christine uh, Kölzer, Kapil Gupta, Satish Yadav, Ulfuk Boruka and Julian Carpin, as well as Frederic Garzoni worked in our lab to produce Spike and, and the cryo-EM structure. We worked with Andrew Davidson and Adrian Mulholland did MD, uh, performed MD simulations, which I didn't have the time to show. And I would also like to thank Wellcome Trust and, um, and Oracle for helping to, um, to, act to actually fund this work. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, uh, Christian. That was a fascinating uh, talk. We will switch over now to uh, Nicole. Hi, yes, we can, we can see your slides. Yes, thank you. Great. Uh, thank you uh, again. Thank you to the organisers for this opportunity and thank you to Nat for the great introduction. Um, so I'm going to talk about some of the modelling that we're doing at the Synthetic Biology Research Centre. Uh, specifically today I'm going to talk about the genome scale metabolic modelling work that we've been doing to try and help the experimental work that we're doing. So Nat already gave a really nice introduction to the SBRC but just a quick recap. So we're engineering bacteria to provide alternative and sustainable routes to producing platform chemicals that are otherwise produced via fossil fuels. And also importantly, these bacteria can grow on C1 feedstocks such as carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide that are produced in large quantities in industry such as steel mills uh, that contribute to uh, greenhouse gases and global warming. So the idea here is that we'll use these bacteria as microbial factories for converting these waste gases into more valuable added qu uh, chemicals. So how does the genome scale metabolic modeling work that we're doing in the SBRC fit into the overall work that the SBRC are doing? So we start off from selecting a wild type strain so as we've already mentioned, the first criteria is that the bacteria have to grow on C1 compounds. And we also want them to be able to grow to high cell densities, since the more cells we have, the more product we have. We then have to do some data collection. Uh, initially, it's very important that we have an accurate genome annotation. And then we want to start to, to collect uh, physiological characterization, growth curves, uh, nutrient demand, et cetera. And this then allows us to construct a genome scale model. Uh, so this starts from the genome annotation. We can build a genome scale model and then validate it using our experimental data. Once we're happy with our initial model, we can start to simulate the behavior of these bacteria so we can assess different pathways for producing our product, see how which pathways have optimal yield or minimum energy requirements, for example. We can also look to use these models for identifying genes to either delete or insert into the bacteria for ensuring that we've got our product being made. And we can also use these models to just have a general um, better understanding at the system level of the bacteria's uh, cellular metabolism. So once we've made some predictions, we can then test these in the lab. The SBRC experimentalists have constructed a lot of genetic tools that allow us to insert or delete genes uh, into our bacteria. And then after this process, ideally we'll end up with a chassis that is, an, is efficient at producing our product and ideally also has high growth rates. More often than not, however, you can end up with a suboptimal strain. And this is just to highlight that we go through this process several times um, it's an iterative cycle where we keep informing each step as we go around. 
So hopefully that gives you an idea of how the genome scale models modeling work fits in with the overall work that's being done in the SBRC, what, what actually is a genome scale model. So I mentioned that it starts from the annotated genome. So this provides us with all the information of the genes that are in the bacteria, the gene functions that we can then ex allow us to extract the entire set of biochemical reactions. This results in a large intricate metabolic network of metabolites and reactions and the genes that are associated to them reactions. To get to this point, it's quite a fast process, so long as you have an accurate genome annotation. There's lots of automated tools available that allow you to extract, this informa extract the information from databases such as KEG, such as Biopsych. However, at this point, you're, it's very unlikely that the model is going to be functioning and producing results that are comparable to those from the lab. So then we do some model refinement. This is where it's a lot more work involved. So we need to make sure the reactions are mass balanced, check the directions. Uh, there's going to be some missing annotation in our genome, so we have to do some gap filling. And then we add a biomass reaction to represent cellular growth of the bacteria. And we've carried out this process for three different bacteria that we're interested in at the SBRC. So Cuprovidus necata, that's our core um, bacteria that we're working with in the SBRC. And we've got Clostridium autoethanogenum, both of which were constructed in collaboration with Oxford Brookes University. We also have a model for Eubacterium limosum. Again, this was constructed in collaboration with the Korean Advanced Institute of Science and Technology and also the University of Toulouse. So here in the table, this is just to highlight the number of reactions, metabolites and genes that are in these uh, models, just to show you the kind of size of the models that we're working with. Once we have our construction, we can then start to simulate the behavior of our bacteria using the models. We do this using an approach called flux balance analysis. This is a constraint based approach. So before we have any constraints in the network, we have an unlimited amount of flux or flow of metabolites coming into the system or being produced uh, out of the system. And so we have an unconstrained solution space as is highlighted in this three dimensional uh, figure here. By adding constraints, so a fundamental constraint for flux balance analysis is the steady state constraint, but also adding constraints such as substrate availability. So here highlighted in the diagram on the left, constraining how much of your substrate is coming in. And what this does, it, it reduces your solution space, your feasible solution space to a convex cone. So now any feasible solution, flux distribution through this metabolic network has to lie somewhere within this convex cone. Now, ideally we'd want to explore the entire solution space, but due to the size of these models, it's very computationally expensive. So what flux balance analysis does, it maximizes or minimizes an objective function to identify one optimal flux distribution. And very often in this area, what is used as the objective function is that biomass reaction that I previously mentioned. So this is under the assumption that the bacteria will want to maximize their cellular growth. So hopefully that gave you an idea of what genome scale models are and the flux balance analysis method. Now I'm going to provide a few examples of how we're using these techniques to try and gain more information about the bacteria that we're interested in at the SBRC. So this first example is actually some work that my colleague carried out, Rupert Norman. He, was, he carried out two simulations. In the first one on the left, he's mimicking carbon limitation. And on the right, he's mimicking non-carbon limitation and comparing what the uh, product uh, formation is in the two approaches. So Clostridium autoethanogenum um, is the bacteria Rupert was using, and this can grow on carbon monoxide. So what he did in the left example to maximize, uh, to, do, to simulate carbon limitation, he maximized that growth rate as previously mentioned and increased the carbon monoxide um, along the x-axis. And as you can see, the main product being formed is acetate and then CO2. 
However, then when he simulated non-carbon limiting conditions, this is where he's now fixed his growth rate, his biomass reaction, and still increased CO. So we've got excess uh, carbon monoxide in the system. And now what we see is a, a switch between the products being formed. So a switch between acetate and ethanol being produced. He then took this further by did the same simulation, but continued to increase the carbon monoxide uptake rate. And now he then found, found hydrogen being produced as the main product. However, it's known that hydrogen has a limit on its production due to thermodynamic constraints. And so when Rupert constrained this in the model, he then repeated the simulation and found butendiol being produced. And this was a really nice result because this has not been found using any other uh, genome scale model of sea auto and butendiol is a, an interesting product uh, to try and produce. And if anyone's interested in looking at these results in more detail, Rupert's actually already published this work in engineering biology uh, just last year. So now moving on to the work on Cooper Vedas Necata. Uh, this slide is just to give you an idea of the kind of data that we are collect collecting uh, for uh, using with our models. This is just for fructose, but we're gathering, we've collected a lot of this data now for autotrophic conditions as well. So growth under CO2 and hydrogen, which Cooper Vedas can grow on. So, for example, we've been collecting 13C metabolic flux analysis. So this is carbon tracing experiments. This is limited to just small networks. However, we've used it. This is for this picture that we see here is just central carbon metabolism. But we've been using it to validate our genome scale model. And as you can see in the left hand, uh, sorry, the right hand plot here, we have a reasonable correlation between the two, uh, two approaches. We're also very interested at the SBRC in gene essentiality of these bacteria. We want to know which genes we can knock out, so it's feasible to knock out um, in terms of increasing our product yield. And it can also be helpful in actually identifying growth coupling. So we've actually predicted gene essentiality using our, using our genome scale model. And we've compared this to an experimental technique for identifying gene essentiality, which is called TRADIS. Um, so this, this table here shows the number of true positives, false, false positives, et cetera, but the overall accuracy is around 80%, which is reasonable for a bacteria that's not um, too well studied. So then we did a similar thing to what Rupert did with uh, C. auto with Cooper Vedas. So Cooper Vedas is, um, is, is a really interesting bacteria due to the fact that it can produce as a storage compound a polymer called polyhydroxy uh, polyhydroxybutyric acid or PHB and it produces this as a storage compound which is actually also a biodegradable plastic and it produces it when it has excess carbon and a limit in some other nutri nutrients such as nitrogen. So again, we try to simulate this using our genome scale model, very similar to what Rupert did. We're fixing the growth rate and we're forcing fructose, so forcing excess carbon into our uh, model, into our system, and then looking what products we're producing due to that excess carbon. And what we have here is a lot of pyruvate is being made. And then initially we have some acetate being made. However, from our experiments, from the SPRC experiments, we know that acetate isn't produced very high quantities and we're missing that PHB being produced. So what we then tried is integrating omics data or particularly gene expression data to see if we could get the model to produce more uh, accurate phenotypes. And what we're doing here is we're in the simulation, in the flux balance analysis simulation, we're penalizing reactions for carrying flux if the gene, if their corresponding gene has a low expression in the, in the gene expression data. And as you can see here, we now have, we still have pyruvate being made, but we also now have our PHB being made. So this was a, a nice example to show where using omics data can help improve our model for predicting more accurate phenotypes. And this is just preliminary work, but we're hoping to publish this really soon. 
And then as a final example, this is actually an example where we've increased ethylene production in E. coli. It's not an example of a C1 feeding bacteria. However, it's a nice example where we've gone through that cycle that we showed that I showed at the beginning to increase a product. So in this, in this example, what we were doing here, we were inserting an enzyme, the ethylene forming enzyme that's found, in, found native in other bacteria, inserting this into E. coli, and then we use the genome scale model of E. coli to simulate gene knockouts using two approaches. One was flux, the standard flux balance analysis, and another was an alternative to flux balance analysis, which is called minimization of metabolic adjustment, or MoMA for short. And using these two approaches, we had two candidates. The first candidate was knocking out the gene SUC-A. This is the reaction here where we've got alpha ketoglutarate going to succinyl CoA, which is part of the TCA cycle. Um, and what we found using the modeling is that what's happening here is that the um, alpha, the blocking, the block through this flux here means that you get higher alpha ketoglutarate availability, and so then redirects flux through this EFE enzyme. This was tested in the lab, however, and we found a mixture of some strains producing ethylene and some not producing ethylene, so it wasn't 100% guaranteed. We then tested, we then looked at the second candidate that we had that was actually identified via the FBA approach and also the MoMA approach, and involves knocking out either of pro-A or pro-B. These are genes corresponding to proline biosynthesis pathway and results in uh, blocking any flux towards proline, and the only way of restoring this flux is then again via this EFE enzyme. This was carried out in the lab by Samantha Bryan and her PhD students, and they were able to uh, find a tri triple the amount of ethylene yield using this knockout. So we've got two plots here. Uh, where we've used two different plasmids. The second plasmid has a higher copy number, but both result in around three times as much ethylene. We then did uh, random mutagenesis and enzyme evolution to see if we could then further increase the yield of ethylene. So the top plot is the random mutagenesis and the bottom plot is enzyme evolution. And again, this resulted in around double the amount of ethylene being produced. What we then did is we selected the strains that had the highest amount of ethylene and we resequenced them to identify the SNPs that could potentially be causing this increase in ethylene. We also collected metabolomics data and we also then went back to the genome scale model to carry out what's called a flux response analysis. So this is where we increase ethylene in the model from zero to the maximum amount of ethylene, ethylene, and we look to see how the rest of the reactions in the model are responding. So this plot here, this figure here, just shows the central carbon metabolism, where the blue reactions are those that decrease to increase ethylene, and the red reactions are those that increase with increased ethylene. And we're particularly interested in looking at how the, the reactions that corresponded to the genes that had a SNP in, how they responded, and we also compared to the metabolomics um, analysis. And the general conclusion from this analysis was that uh, the SNPs were potentially causing an increase in the alpha ketoglutarate substrate availability. So this is a substrate to the EFE enzyme, and we speculated that the SNPs were potentially disrupting the ammonia simulation and regulation pathways that allowed for this increase of alpha ketoglutarate that is otherwise quite tightly regulated. So hopefully that's given you um, some examples of the kind of modeling that we're doing at the SBRC to help the experimental work that we're doing. But just to summarize, we have a number of different genome scale models constructed within the SBRC in collaboration with uh, different universities. In particular, with the collaboration with Oxford Brookes University, we also are working on methanotroph genome scale models and also acetobacterium woodii genome scale model. 
We've also collected a lot of data for refining these models, making them more condition specific. In particular, we're very interested in the, we've, and we've, construct, we've carried out a lot of TRADIS experiments for our bacteria, which as I mentioned is useful for um, knowing which genes we can and can't knock out or potentially helping predict growth coupling strategies. We've also now collected a lot of omics data in particular for autotrophic conditions with, pro, with proteomics, transcriptomics and metabolomics that we're now integrating into our gene and scale model, making a more condition specific model. And then finally, finally, we're also very interested in developing modeling tools for helping to analyze these gene and scale models. We have a tool published already called JSM Modules. You can find this available on the GitHub link provided there. This is basically a tool for managing genome scale models. As I showed at the beginning of the talk, that cycle where we're constantly feeding new experimental data into the model, making changes to, uh, to adjust to the results and doing further tests to validate the model. And we want to make sure we don't break any other validated tests in doing so. So this is a, a nice tool for managing the, the changes that you're making in these models. We're also very interested in developing tools for integrating thermodynamics, so ensure, ensuring that any flux distributions we predict using our models are thermodynamically feasible. And then since we have a lot of omics data that we've collected now, we're also very interested in developing novel ways of integrating the, these tech, these, this data into our genome scale models. So thank you very much for listening. There's a lot of people to thank in the SBRC and also our collaborators, Dr. Brooks, Keist, the KAIST Institute, uh, the supervisors and experimentalists and our funders. Um, so I'll just leave that slide there for a minute. And also you can find my email address there. But thank you very much for listening. Okay, wonderful. These were a couple of uh, wonderful talks. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Christian and Nicole. We have quite uh, lots of questions, so uh, without further ado, I will start uh, uh, reading them. So the uh, first question is uh, for Christian and come from Joshua uh, Beaton. Would supplementation of linoleic acid prior to infection with COVID-19 aid with mitigating the severity of the symptoms? Um. Yeah, I mean, obviously, we take up a lot of linoleic acid already with our food. So the linoleic acid is a vitamin and there is lots of linoleic acid in seeds, nuts and fish. And so usually with a normal diet, you have enough. Um, but it seems like once you are infected with the virus, you quickly deplete the linoleic acid pool. And especially in severe disease patients, this can even be measured in the zero of um, of, of the patients. And so our idea is not really that prior to infection you should use LA, uh, but once you have been exposed to somebody who, like basically when the tracking, uh, the tracing app shows you that you have been in, um, exposed to COVID-19, that then you would maybe um, take linoleic acid um, and it is probably not global with food where you will have to absorb it and the fatty acids are not very soluble so um, intravenous or with the food it's not very efficient but it would probably be better if one could up, could apply it with a nasal spray or um, or maybe a mouthwash basically to, to the infected region should be directly treated with linoleic acid which makes it potentially easier. Having said that, that's a proper clinical trial, so we need to do the toxicology, we need to get proper dose response curves, and we and uh, cell cultures are not enough, so we need to go into animals to test the idea that linoleic acid is a drug and find out how good it is as a drug. Okay, thank you for that. A related question is the following by Adrian Banzer. Linoleic acid decreases the KD of spike to ACE2 by a factor of two. Is this slight reduce in affinity sufficient to explain the in vivo effect of SARS-CoV-2 replication or does linoleic acid have additional effects? 
there are additional effects of uh, linoleic acid. So, A, we don't really, so this has been done in vitro and we don't really know in vivo how much linoleic acid is there. So, it could be that the concentration in cell culture and afterwards in vivo is a completely different compared to the one which we use with um, epithelial cells. That's my first point. The second point, I mean, linoleic acid is metabolized in the body and it is incorporated in membranes, as I said. And one thing the virus does when it enters the cell is actually act activate a phospholipase. And this phospholipase then helps the virus to remodel the biomembranes and make these compartments in which it replicates. And so it needs these fatty acids. Um, the phospholipase, the cytosolic phospholipase, it activates, doesn't only release linoleic acid from the membranes and damage the membrane, but linoleic acid also then at a certain concentration starts blocking the phospholipase. So this could be an additional effect of linoleic acid. And there's a third potential mechanism where it, which is too complicated to explain, but basically it blocks the egress of the virus when it comes out. So mm -hmm. it's, it's much more complicated than just blocking down the infectivity. I think we just need to do more experiments um, in order to fully understand where actually linoleic acid um, is important. And then this is such a versatile molecule that it's really difficult to grab all the different functions. Because as I said, it's metabolized to arachidonic acid or to prostaglandins. So there is a lot of downstream biological activity of that molecule as well. Okay, thank you. And now we'll ask uh, one more question for Christian, then we'll move the question for Nicole that uh, people are also queuing uh, to hear her respond. So, uh, following on, on that uh, previous response, the question from Lindsay McDermott is whether you have tested uh, for binding of other polyunsaturated fatty acids to the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. Yes, we get a lot of these questions <laughs> and there's a lot of modeling in the field to kind of see what else fits into that hydrophobic pocket. So, we have actually try to bind also other molecules um, to the, the receptor binding domain, but it seems to be not that simple. So for me, that this means that whatever we have modeled may fit nicely into the pocket, but there is a high energy of actually opening up that model, uh, that pocket and getting the molecule in. And um, maybe our assay doesn't really monitor that nicely. So the only thing we could bind up to now to the RBD is linoleic acid. Um, but having said that, we are not entirely sure that the pocket can, like, like even in vivo, we are not sure whether arachidonic acid or other unsaturated fatty acids couldn't bind as well. It's just that linoleic acid is what we found because it was in our media. Also, we have done the modeling and other molecules fit in there as well, but it could well be that these molecules need to be present when the spike protein is produced and folds, so in the cell and not once it's out um, and, and fully folded. So we, there is uh, lots of additional work to do to understand how we can make an antiviral and what is exactly the specificity of that pocket. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. If we have time, we'll come for more, for more questions that we have in the list. Uh, Nicole, I have a question uh, for you from uh, Beknas uh, Norosi. Uh, he's asking whether the uh, 13C metabolic flux, flux analysis was done with labeled fructose. Was gene essentiality prediction done by having lower growth? And were your experiment perform, perform as batch fermentation in bioreactors? So essentially three questions in one. Okay, so sorry. So the first question was about the metabolic flux, the 13C metabolic flux analysis. If it was uh, lab labeled with fructose. Yeah, labeled with fructose in batch culture. Okay. Is that um, yeah, yes, that's, that's, that's part of the question. The other is, is asking whether gene essentiality prediction was done by having lower growth or, or, or some other by informatic uh, um, methodology. So in the genome scale model or in the TRADIS data? Uh, the, I suppose in the gene scale model. Uh, the genome scale model, it was just, I would 
fix the growth rate and then just look to see if by knocking that gene out you can get any flux on or on any growth rate so usually it would be that you can't get flux on any any growth at all under fructose i don't know okay. if that's the question and the and the last part of the question was whether the experiments were performed in batch fermentation by your react so initial initial experiments have been done in batch but the uh, analysis the results that we've got now have been done in chemostat mm -hmm. mm -hmm. okay thank you another question for you nicole from uh, ian hunter actually there are several questions in one how refined is your composition for biomass for each bacterial species? And he goes on to say that presumably the content related to, um, to each amino acid per biomass, DNA, RNA base, fatty acid, lipid, etc. So uh, it's different for different for the different bacteria. So for cuprovirus, uh, we've actually used the biomass that's already been published in a paper by uh, a part, uh, it's a Korean group. I can send, if they're interested, I can send them the paper. But I just used the biomass composition given in there. For the cl uh, Clostridium autoethanogenum, SBRC constructed, uh, uh, experimentally um, obtained these values for the biomass composition. And for Eubacterium lamosum, the, um, the KAIST group, the Korean Advanced Institute of Science and Technology, they did that their end. They, they calculated all the experimentally calculated the uh, biomass composition. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, another question for you, Nicole, from uh, uh, Gavin Thomas. When you apply your expression data, how do you use to, uh, how do you use do you use this to limit fluxes? Were you tuning reactions on and off or just limiting total flux depending on expression? So there are there's different ways that you can that you can integrate this expression data. So there's one technique that we've been exploring at the minute that I can't give too much details on because we've not it's a novel approach and we've not uh, published it yet and it's also with collaboration with Oxford Brook so I'm not sure how much details I can give but another uh, one of the approaches that we've also tried is a pro is an approach which I'm not sure he's familiar with but it's called um, gimme it's a method in already published I think by um, Paulson's group he's a big gene and scale modeling guy uh, in the US and basically what it does it doesn't um, it doesn't weight all of the reactions according to the gene expression but it actually just it basically turns off you give a threshold based on you you set that threshold so it might be that you look at the uh, I don't know the quantile for example the tenth uh, or the 25 the 25 percent of the data and anything anything below that you cut it off or whatever you've decided is, that should be a threshold. But then what it does, because you can't have a then solution, there's probably some reactions that may only have very small, only require a gene that has very small gene expression. What it then does, it allows them to carry flux, but they'll have a penalty on the objective function to be on, or in the flux balance analysis to be on. Okay, thank you very much for, for, for that question. I have another uh, question for, for you, Nicole. In the in silico analysis, uh, you uh, you do knock-ins and knock-down analysis, but this is a combinatorial problem. Very rapidly, can get uh, uh, quite quite hard. So, how do you mm -hmm. deal with this uh, combinatorial explosion, especially with the knock-in, uh, both for the simulation and then for ascertaining ascertaining which potential solutions to carry on experiment experimenting with. So you mean because if you were to go above like two knockouts, I think is what they're meaning. So in terms of that, so the, the, the example that I showed was actually only exploring double knockouts. That's quite straightforward to just loop through your model and do that. However, in order to then do, you know, if you want to explore five, five genes being knocked out, what we can then do or what we've explored techniques of using is optimization approach uh, optimization approaches that use genetic algorithms such as um, a tool called optflux and this uses a genetic algorithm to try and it'll look for a gene to knock out it'll search for if one gene 
may provide you a small amount of flux it'll then build and build up on that until you get a um, strain that's producing um, more flux based on how many genes you've knocked out so it's it's not an exhaustive search of the entire solution space it may get because of that it's a genetic algorithm you may get stuck in a, a local optima it's not necessarily going to be the the highest producing strain um however it's, it's a way of getting around that problem there's also techniques such as op knock um is another tool in the in the area uh, this, just, this I think is a, a mixed intralinear programming uh, tool that allows you to then uh, try and solve this issue of finding more than just two knockouts. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a few more questions for uh, coming up for uh, uh, Christian. So this is from uh, Maitre Shivkumar and says that uh, would you expect the drugs that, tar that target the hydrophobic pockets in the RBD to be sufficient to block infection, or would they have to be used alongside an antiviral like remdesivir as a synergistic effect? That's of course an excellent question. We don't have, we don't have an antiviral there. So one encouraging uh, fact also for future pandemics with coronavirus is that the pocket is conserved. So it could be really useful to target the pocket, but then there's always the danger that there is a mutant which makes the pocket resistant to close the pocket. A single um, negatively charged residue would potentially be enough at the entrance of the pocket to completely uh, interfere with entrance. And so therefore, I would think that antivirals should be combination therapy, like in HIV, where, you, where a single mutation cannot make the virus resistant against the therapy. So I, yes, I would think that we should kind of envision an idea therapy to consist of more than one molecule to avoid the coronaviruses to become resistant. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And related to that question, uh, another one from Jack uh, uh, Stav. Uh, is that uh, you showed experiments uh, combining the rem, 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 rem with linoleic acid. Uh, have you done any experiments uh, using other combinations uh, drugs with, for example, dextamethasone? No, we didn't. But um, what is quite interesting is that it seems that dexamethasone and other glucocorticoid uh, steroids seem to fit really nicely into that pocket. Um, no, we didn't do the experiment, but it's something to be done. Okay, and I have here the last question uh, for the evening, it seems. Uh, how selective is the binding of the fatty acid analogs drugs to the targets? Yeah, so the fatty acid analog drugs. Um, to the targets. I'm, yeah, unfortunately there are none. Um, there's <laughs> A very quick question. I don't know a quick answer to a question. Okay. Okay. With this, we will uh, we will finish. This is the the last question. I would like first of all to uh, thank the speaker for two wonderful uh, presentations and, and and really nice uh, session of questions and answer, and of course the audience. And I will invite you all to continue the discussions online via the Twitter handles of the Biochemical Society and Portland Press. Um, just to uh, mention that it's not a coincidence that uh, we are focusing uh, this webinar series on the area of synthetic biology, this one now and the one next week, uh, because we were supposed to be having the synthetic biology uh, UK 2020 conference meeting in Nottingham. Unfortunately, uh, this didn't take place due to the pandemics, but we are all looking forward to a brighter future, so you can now register your interest for SBUK in November 2021 uh, in the Biochemical Society uh, website. Um, there, is a, there is going to be the follow-up to, uh, to this webinar next uh, Thursday 26 at 3 with a topic of developments in industrial biotechnology and again you can register to that uh, website uh, to that webinar uh, in the society website uh, finally 
Uh, I would like to, to, to invite you to join the Biochemical Society community. It has great resources for uh, all career stages, uh, grants, uh, um, uh, and, a, and a number of discounts for conferences and meetings. So it's a good opportunity to check the website and, and, and see whether it's worth uh, uh, joining up. With this, I will finish here. Thank you all again and have a great weekend.